Good afternoon. National Assembly of Wales is now in session. And I'm sure members would like to uh, join me in welcoming members of the Joint Committee on Public Service Oversight and Petitions from the Parliament of the Irish Republic, who are in the public gallery today. Yeah. I, th I, think, I think they're behind me up there somewhere. I'm not sure. And I wish to inform members that on Friday I received written notification from Antoinette Sandbach of her resignation with immediate effect as Assembly Member for her, uh, as following her election to Member of Parliament for Edisbury. And today I've received notification from Byron Davis that he too is resigning his seat at the Assembly following his election as a Member of Gower. His resignation will be effective from May the 15th. I have informed the Regional Returning Officer for North Wales of the vacancy that now exists for that region, and I'll be writing to the Returning Officer of South Wales West in the same vein. I will await the Returning Officer's notifications regarding new members for their respective regions, and I will make further announcement to members in due course. I'm sure we all you'd like to join me in wishing Antoinette and Byron all the best in the future. We now move to questions, First Minister, and question one is Julie Morgan. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. What does the First Minister think the effect of the general election will be on Wales? Uh, we have yet to know, of course. Uh, we await uh, what the Queen's speech will show and what the uh, budget will show. Uh, but, of course, I, I take note of the fact that uh, promise has been made that uh, legislation for further devolution for Wales will be delivered within 100 days. We wait to see if that promise is kept. I thank the First Minister for that response. And um, does he think that a key priority for the Westminster Government must be to deliver the commitments it made to the people of Wales in terms of cutting the seven bridge tolls, providing the resources to put in a city deal for Cardiff, funding the electrification of the valley lines and the first great western main line? And will he be pressing the incoming government to give the attention to Welsh issues that the people of Wales deserve so that it doesn't spend all its energy on Scotland? Yes, I have a phone call with the uh, Prime Minister very shortly. Uh, I will be uh, saying, of course, there's a need to uh, move forward with the Wales Bill, as he has promised, in terms of the seven bridge tolls. Uh, the view of the Welsh Government is they should be controlled from within Wales rather than the profits going entirely, entirely to pay for English roads, as they will uh, once the uh, bridge returns to public ownership. And, of course, with the Metro, there will be a need for the UK Government to deliver alongside us, particularly, for example, if light rail uh, is the option that is uh, preferred in terms of the future of the Metro. Mark Ishwood. Uh, thank you. Well, during the uh, general election, one of the repeated concerns raised on the doorstep um, applied to devolved matters such as housing and health. Um, and nine times out of ten, um, the comments related to, wrongly, the UK government uh, rather than the Welsh government, which, of course, has been responsible since 1999. Is this a, sh a concern that you share with me? And if so, what action does the Welsh government propose to try and improve public understanding in places like North East Wales, uh, and elsewhere uh, around the matters for which this place is responsible ahead of the Welsh general election last year. We know that uh, part of the problem is, of course, that more than 80% of the population get their print news from outside Wales, and the London media don't bother with Wales in terms of, of publishing separate editions as they do for Scotland. Uh, we know, of course, that it's the broadcast media that is most responsible for broadcasting, for informing uh, the public here in Wales. Of course, in the North East, historically, uh, there was a tendency to, to uh, turn aerials to transmit us away from uh, the from Moyla Park uh, as the uh, the transmitter for the uh, for the area. Uh, my suspicion is that as people have uh, begun to understand more about the assembly, they have taken more interest in terms of what it does. But and that was right to say, of course, uh, that the the understanding of who does what is not entirely clear to the public yet. Simon Thomas. Uh, Thank you, presiding officer. Well, one of the first statements made by the new government in Westminster is one to abolish the Human Rights Act. Now, the Human Rights Act, it's not only provides, providing defence to people in Wales, but it's also written into the Welsh Constitution through the Government of Wales Act, and it's part of the uh, Constitution of the UK in Northern Ireland and Scotland too. So what negotiations, if you are to have a conversation with the Prime Minister soon, what negotiations will you have with the Prime Minister to ensure that the Welsh voice and the interests that come to Wales from the Human Rights Act are retained here in Wales? Well, my view, of course, is that that act should be retained. I don't think any comment has been made on the situation of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. That will be um, that won't be their first thoughts, obviously. But I met with a group that looked at a British rights bill some years ago. And it's true to say they didn't have very much of a clue about how it would work. 
uh, with devolution but we will have to see what will be what they will say will be put, uh, given to replace it Minister, do you agree with me that we must continue to press for a constitutional convention and as part of that a fair funding formula for all the regions of the UK? And do you also agree that Wales should proactively engage with other regions of the UK to press for change that is be of benefit and sustainable for the whole of the UK? Yes, we should work, of course, with our fellow nations and, of course, with the, with the English uh, regions. Uh, I don't think we'll ever get to a situation where we have the stability that we need without such a convention. Uh, I note the views of my colleague in Northern Ireland, Peter Robinson, who is also uh, in agreement uh, with the uh, principle of a convention. Uh, this is not something to be afraid of. This is something to uh, strengthen the constitution of the UK for the 21st century. Question two, Alan Fred-Jones. Right, Will the First Minister make a statement on the progress made over the last four years in relation to the Welsh Government's Welsh language strategy? Well, over the last four years, we have made huge strides in implementing our Living Language, a Language for Living strategy. These include notable developments in the field of education, legislation and promotion. And there's more important work yet to do over the remaining two years of the strategy. Your emphasis four years ago was on increasing the numbers of Welsh speakers and providing opportunities to use the Welsh language. Well, what steps within the strategy that you mentioned do you believe will contribute most to achieving these objectives? Well, the principles, of course, are contained within the policy statement bottom line which ensures that uh, it's a living language, the Welsh language that is used and that there is a difference in people's habits in using the language and in the community's uh, use of the language and also that we want to ensure that Welsh is used in technology. Technology, The Earth have done very good work in having Welsh apps in ensuring that the Welsh language is a natural language to use on Facebook and Twitter. We want to ensure, of course, that Welsh is spoken and it's also important to ensure that the Welsh, Welsh language is used as a language of technology too in this century. Thank you very much. First Minister, I've heard today about the national entity that you created, but it's a matter of choice as to which language people use, is a very, and that's a very personal choice. So what would your personal message be to adults who are a little uncertain and perhaps aren't quite sure of the value of learning and using the Welsh language? Well, what we do know is that very many adults start to learn Welsh every year and we also know that very many do not continue to learn Welsh. So we must ensure that people have the confidence that they can continue to learn the language and also to use the language. Of course, we all know of people who are truly fluent in Welsh but are apprehensive or afraid of using the Welsh language in an official way or using the uh, Welsh language without scripts as it were but confidence is the key and we must ensure that people learn the language and have the confidence to use the language in many fields. Now move to questions of party leaders and first this afternoon is the leader of Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood. Dear Llywydd, First Minister, the Secretary of State for Wales yesterday made a comment indicating an unwillingness to consider further meaningful devolution. And it's looking increasingly likely that the previously agreed timetable regarding further devolution no longer stands. Now that we have a Westminster government without a mandate from this country, would you agree with me that the time is now long overdue to strengthen the Welsh devolution settlement? Yes, well, I saw what the Prime Minister said in terms of uh, delivering for Wales within 100 days. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, there, are element, there are signs that that's being rolled back from. I've never agreed with Wales being treated differently from Scotland in that uh, regard. And I would hope that there is a recognition that there is a mandate for the UK government in England. Not so in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And the Prime Minister must show that he can be the Prime Minister of Britain, not just the Prime Minister of England. Thank you for your answer, First Minister. As the person leading Wales's government and following on from the response that you've just uh, given, 
Can you tell me whether or not your government's position has changed uh, regarding this from before? What measures, for example, do you now support that might help to mitigate against the cuts that we know are coming? Do you uh, support measures, for example, that go beyond um, silk? And will you be articulating any changed position to the Prime Minister when you speak to him? Yes, I do uh, think that we should go beyond silk. We know that the Smith Commission, in terms of uh, Scotland, has offered more devolution for Scotland. I think that offer should be made to Wales. She will know, and I've said this before, that doesn't automatically mean we should accept everything because sometimes there are bear traps that are laid uh, for us. But nevertheless, Smith changed the nature of devolution as far as Scotland is concerned. It is naive to think in Whitehall that somehow this has no effect on Wales. But I think the first step has to be for us to see delivery on what is at least at this moment in time agreed by all the parties, and then, of course, uh, look at uh, how the, the uh, settlement can be strengthened in the future. But the first uh, thing to do is to make sure that the promise of action within 100 days is kept by the Conservative government. Well, I think it's clear, First Minister, that many Welsh communities will be looking to your government for some sort of protection from the further cuts and the coming reforms which don't have support from the majority of people in this country. Now, the Tories haven't been upfront about where the axe is going to fall. We know that we can expect a further £12 billion pounds worth of uh, welfare cuts. Now, I'm not sure whether or not you've considered whether or not a, a UK-wide welfare system will continue into the future, uh, and if not, um, what we are going to do about that. Now, it's likely that Scotland will get powers over welfare. Will powers over welfare be something that you will now be seeking from Westminster for Wales? Well, two points. First of all, we don't know what the scale of the cuts will be. We have to wait and see what happens. We have an idea, but we don't know until we see the, uh, the first financial settlement. Secondly, the welfare system does transfer money into Wales. And we should be very wary about changing a system that, is, uh, that provides us with a positive benefit. There is no UK-wide benefit system. Of course, it's a GB-wide benefit system. In Northern Ireland, welfare has devolved, but we see what's happened there is that there's no agreement in terms of what should happen with the bedroom tax, for example, but there's no money to pay for what the Northern Ireland executive, or part of the Northern Ireland executive, would want to do. So having the powers is one thing. Having the money to deliver on people's expectations is another. Uh, and we should examine very, very carefully whether uh, wholesale welfare devolution is actually in Wales is interests if it means we then lose a chunk of money that is at present being transferred into Wales. That said, I do share her concern about what's in the pipeline. Uh, now that she nor me will know uh, what's going to be proposed by the, uh, by the Conservative government, it's a change from coalition, but Conservative government, uh, we will have to wait and see and then of course make our assessment in terms of uh, what it means for Wales. We now move to the leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats, Kirsty Williams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, Amnesty International have said that human rights must not be a political plaything to be bestowed or scrapped on a whim. My party, the Welsh Liberal Democrats, agree with them. Do you? Yes. It seems pretty clear now, First Minister, that one of the priorities for the new Conservative government is to put us in the same category as Belarus and Kazakhstan in terms of how we view human rights. In fact, to achieve what they really want, they actually need to withdraw from the, U the UK from the Europe Convention on Human Rights. What assessment has your government made of the potential impact on our devolution settlement of any changes to the legislation that protects human rights in this country? Well, it makes us look like a banana republic, frankly. I mean, most countries in Europe, including Russia, are signatories, are members of the European Convention. The European Convention was drafted by British lawyers. It's a British invention. That there's a complete lack of understanding of history, of course, uh, in, uh, in Whitehall at the moment, but that's the reality of it. Now, when I met, as I said earlier on in, in uh, answers to uh, another member, when I met with the group that was looking at creating a British Bill of Rights, it was clear to me they had absolutely no idea what they were being asked to do, and they had absolutely no idea where devolution would fit in that regard. And we still don't know if the Human Rights Act is scrapped, what that means for the different settlements. It's an essential part of the Northern Ireland settlement, I don't believe that any thought's been given to that. It's all been focused on what it means uh, for, uh, what it doesn't mean then for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and a lot of work will need to be done by the Conservative Government in terms of ensuring that that is got right. Well, First Minister, QC Philip Sands is on the record this morning as saying that to do that, that we'd have to have a complete rewriting of the Government of Wales Act. First Minister, what steps will your government take to protect the principles enshrined within the Human Rights Act here in Wales? 
And what, what will you give us as your guarantee that you will fight alongside others, including my party, to ensure that any moves by the UK <coughs> Government to abolish the Act are resisted? It, it's a strange scenario that we find now where uh, she and I uh, are on the same side after many years of, uh, of uh, combat <laughs> across this chamber. <laughs> and, I, and I very much welcome that. But, but she is right. Uh, she is right to say uh, that we should not move to a situation where the rights of individuals are weakened as a result of proposals by the Conservative Government. And we will do as a government, all that we can to ensure that the rights our citizens presently enjoy are not eroded by any proposals that come from Westminster. We might now lead, move to the Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Archie Davis. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, uh, do you agree with the member for Blino Gwent that the Labour government here has completely lost the argument when it comes to uh, the NHS in Wales? Well, let me give you some statistics in terms of the NHS. Every day, 100 babies are born, 50,000 people see a GP, 20,000 people see a dentist, 280,000 individual medicines are prescribed, 12,000 people have an outpatient appointment, 2,500 people are discharged from hospital, 10,000 x-rays are carried out. And we know that most people get good treatment most of the time. There will be occasions when that doesn't happen, and it's important to rectify matters when there are weaknesses in the system. That said, I accept, of course, that there are lessons for us, us as a party, in terms of our messaging. Uh, for us, we have very high standards, uh, and we did not reach those standards last week. For us, 25 seats is too low. For him, it would be marvellous, but for us, it's too low. There are, I think, lessons for all parties within this chamber. There are lessons for us in terms of what happened last week. And as a party, we must listen to the people of Wales and understand what they're saying to us. Particularly, we need to appeal to those people uh, who are running small businesses, for example, who are not millionaires but are working very, very hard. We must appeal to them uh, and to all sections of society. Uh, Plaid will have their own ideas in terms we'll of what happened to, to the them, the Lib Dems as well. But I have to say the leader of the Conservatives as well. His party did well last week. I, I grant him that, and they gained seats. Still only 11 out of 40. And the people of Wales did say very clearly they didn't want to have a Conservative government. The test for his party Kingdom. will be to make sure that the understanding of the preferences of Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are well understood in London. First Minister, uh, we live in the United Kingdom and the United Kingdom voted for a Conservative government yeah, last week yeah. and comprehensively voted for a Conservative government. I'm sorry to hear of your narrow nationalism uh, here today in response to the nationalists and in response to my first question was in relation to what one of your own members had said that you had comprehensively lost the argument. Also, it is interesting to know that a former employee and advisor to the Public Service Minister and a special advisor to the former Secretary of State for Wales, Peter Hain, David Taylor, said that you were in denial. Well, we can see by your answers that you are in denial. What assurances can we get from you today that you will change tact, you will listen to people's concerns on the NHS, and you will start to address the loss of services in communities, and importantly, the one in seven people who are on a waiting list here in Wales. We hear that message loud and clear, uh, and we will be working hard to make sure that the NHS sees its improvements over the next 12 months. I do not underestimate the worry that some people have in some parts of Wales in terms of the NHS, and as a government we recognise that, and we will be working to deal with that. But I'm worried about what he said about the, the general election. He cannot possibly claim that he can ignore Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland what happened there. There are great dangers there. And one of the issues that has to be addressed is how we keep, and he is in the same position as me on this particular issue, the UK together. Denying what happened in Scotland will not do that. And I hope that that is not th th within the thought of David Cameron as, as Prime Minister. Otherwise, the union is lost. First, first Minister, first of all, I do have to pass on my former colleagues uh, in this institution to see a thanks for your canvassing in Barry last Wednesday. Mr Alan Kins wanted to pass that on because you doubled his majority uh, by going out and canvassing for him. But I do agree with you entirely. I do agree entirely with you that the United Kingdom is vital in the integrity of the United Kingdom. That is why the Prime Minister, that is why the Prime Minister, not only on the steps of Downing Street, but in his acceptance speech, in his acceptance speech at his own declaration, 
referred to the importance of Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland in the United Kingdom and the commitment that his government will have in its first 100 days to delivering for those parts of the United Kingdom. But I do want, but I do want to take up and order, offer our order. support on the comments that you made after the election about business. It is vital that business is encouraged and motivated here in Wales. And we need to be speaking more kindly to businesses here. That is why we have brought forward so many proposals, Invest Wales, lowering business rates, inward investment strategies, housing strategy. And I make this commitment to you. Where you want to work, we will work with you to make sure Wales is a more prosperous place. We have the ideas. Those ideas can come forward and come a reality if you want to embrace them, First Minister. Well, uh I run a small business. Uh, I know what small businesses um, the challenges that, that they that they face. Well, some of us are full time in this job. He's not. I understand what he's just said there, but there we are. But I, that's that's the um, that's the background that I come from. Uh, we have the best foreign direct investment figures for 30 years. After the uh, we've seen unemployment uh, come down. That's a tribute to the uh, economy minister and the work that she has done together with her uh, officials. Uh, it is important. We I understand full well that if you encourage the private sector, you create more jobs, you create more revenue for the public sector and for public services. In return, the public sector delivers the healthy, well-educated workers the private sector needs and doesn't have to pay for in the way that they would in the US, for example, with health insurance. And that's a big, big burden on, co on companies in uh, America, believe me. But I have to make this point to him. The UK is in an exceptionally difficult position. To ignore what happened in Scotland is a mistake. Your party has one MP, as does mine, in Scotland. To try and say, well, that, that doesn't really matter in terms of the whole of the UK is a mistake. Now, in order to ensure the future of the UK, you've heard me say it many, many times before, the convention is important in terms of getting the structure right. I heard what the Prime Minister said about delivering for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland within 100 days. I look to him to keep that promise of delivery within 100 days. And then, of course, we can see, we can judge whether what he says and what he delivers are the same thing. Thank you very much. We now move to, uh, back to questions on the papers. Question three is Nick Ramsey. Yeah. Will the First Minister make a statement on Welsh Government policies <coughs> for supporting our road infrastructure? Yes, transport links are vital to our economy and we are committed to ensuring a robust and well-maintained road network. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, in last week's questions, you indicated that the Port of Newport's major concerns over disruption to their operations by the Welsh Government's uh, M4 Black Route could be mitigated by uh, a new bridge. Uh, now, given that some estimates have already put the cost of the, your chosen M4 Black Route at over £1 billion, um, will you give us a current assessment of how much you think that that route is going to cost and how much will a new bridge add to the price tag? Well below a £1 billion. The reason why we would not reveal an actual cost at this stage is because we have to negotiate with contractors. And the last thing we would do is declare our hand up front in terms of the, uh, how much money we're prepared to pay. But it's a long, long way underneath £1 billion. Now, we have to get clarity from his party. His Prime Minister has said that the Bringlass tunnels are, and he, as he put it, uh, a, a, a th uh, is throttling the Welsh, well, he said the Welsh economy, he means the South Wales economy, and I agree with him, that, that much is true. But we need to understand two things, whether his party is in fact in favour of an M4 relief role. We don't know that. We know there are different views. We've seen them expressed on Twitter. But secondly, we need to understand what is the best route. Now, preferred route, of course, is the, the, the black route. There are still, of course, issues that need to be addressed. We understand that. But it's, it, would not, it would not be correct to say that there are easy alternatives uh, that are simply being ignored. There are not. If we're going to get this done, we need to get it right. John Griffiths. First Minister, would you agree with me that one way of um, supporting our road infrastructure in Wales and easing the pressure upon it is by taking forward policies that will achieve modal shift and get people onto the trains, onto the buses in greater number through, for example, the metro system, and also that if we implement our Active Travel Act effectively to get more people walking and cycling, that too will ease pressure on our road infrastructure? I think that, that is self-evidently true uh, it's when it comes to modal shift it's easier to get individuals to do it 
than it is for families, for example, because it's, if there are four or five of you, it's cheaper to go by car than it is by train. That can be difficult. It's more difficult, again, to get modal shift in terms of freight because of the freight that goes on lorries. So uh, whilst I agree entirely with him that modal shift is important in terms of taking pressure off the roads, I don't think we can rely on that in terms of the, uh, in terms of the M4. There's a lot of freight traffic on it that can't be moved easily onto the railways. Especially on weekends, a lot of tourists coming in with a, with a lot of luggage in their cars, adding to the traffic, difficult to get them to, to move onto the trains for, for physical reasons. Yeah, as somebody who um, uses public transport regularly, uh, I, I'm more than happy, of course, to, pr to promote its merits. But I think sometimes you have to accept that where you have a problem, yes, you can use modal shift, to an you can promote modal shift to an extent, but nevertheless, there will be occasions when actually building a new road will be important. Same thing applies, of course, to the new term bypass, uh, where it will be unrealistic to expect modal shift to reduce traffic in new town. And that's why, of course, we're, we're so uh, pleased to be able to take forward the new town bypass and to finance it. Rina, if you're with. Thank you. ...have been tying in promises of security uh, on funding for Wales, vital for infrastructure uh, spend, to proposals uh, for the devolution of more powers. Now the BBC is reporting that there will be no rush to bring in uh, further devolution, um, certainly not in the first year of this government. How does that affect your proposals for investing in infrastructure, including road infrastructure uh, in Wales? And how do you plan to lobby UK government on that funding and devolution issue? Well, we don't know. I mean, he, he is right to say uh, that there has been much talk that there will be an, a rowing back from the promise that was given. We have to wait and see. Uh, but it would be extraordinary if the promise uh, not to move forward with further devolution in Wales was not kept uh, and broken within a week of the government coming into power. Uh, you know, I think that would be, uh, people of Wales would find that very difficult to, uh, to accept, to see a promise broken that quickly. But let's wait and see. Uh, from our point of view, uh, we do not accept that somehow Scotland and Wales have to proceed at different speeds in terms of the legislation proceeding through Westminster. If this is going to be done properly, as I've said many, many times before, there has to be a proper four-nation approach to devolution and to the Constitution. Unfortunately, I don't see signs of it so far, and I think that will not be to the UK's good over the next five years. Question four, Keith Davis. How nice. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister provide an outline on the main objectives of orthodontic provision in Wales? Our main objective is to ensure health boards provide orthodontic services which meet the clinically assessed dental health needs of their population. And a recent independent report highlights the improvements we are making. Thank you. I've received a number of complaints recently that young people are on waiting lists for up to three years. What discussions are being had on this and what direction is given to the health boards to reduce these waiting times and what support have they outlined to improve the situation? Well, I understand that the Hawaii Health Board have secured outreach clinics within their area and I understand now that the time people have to wait for an assessment has been reduced significantly and so we hope that this trend will continue over the ensuing months. First Minister, forgive me, but that answer sounded rather complacent from the Welsh Government. These waiting times for orthodontic treatment have been missed year in, year out for as long as you've been First Minister. Some people in Wales are waiting over three and a half years to access their appointments with an orthodontist uh, in Welsh hospitals. That is completely unacceptable. If you're so complacent about this, what are you going to do about the general waiting time problem that your government has here in Wales, which was so manifestly... Uh, rejected in the polls in certain parts of North Wales, particularly in the Vale of Clwyd. Well, he clearly didn't listen carefully to what I just said, One but then the he problems, wouldn't, would you he? Because he had his uh, view that he wanted to put beforehand. How will that provide additional outreach clinics and referral and to carefully. assessment? What are you that has reduced significant... What what if he listened carefully, he I might learn listen. something. Uh, and the time has been reduced Darren significantly Miller, to some four to six time? weeks. That is what we have done. If you listen more carefully, you would get the answers that he seeks. Treatment. Darren Miller. Are you finished, Westminster? Yes. Oh, thank you. Lindsay Whittle. 
Well, Adil, thank you. well, First Minister, you've told us about uh, how are that, uh, and thank you for that, but what specific achievements can you tell us uh, about regarding orthodontics measured against the, the actual oral health plan? And is any of the oral health plan working? It's clearly doing okay in how are that, but uh, there are such serious inconsistencies in services available uh, across Wales. What's happening with the rest of Wales? We, we don't just represent how are that, with the greatest respect to how are that. Well, we have been... Uh... <laughs> Well, I, mean, I, I don't want to add to the discord and applied benches there, but uh, we have been driving through efficiencies and improvements in orthodontic services over the last three years. For example, there has been a 59% reduction in the number of assess and review appointments. It's a major efficiency gain. It's meant that health boards have been able to commission an additional 533 patients per year starting treatment. And those actions, of course, are helping to improve the efficiency of the system, and we will continue to drive that efficiency in the future. Question five, William Powell. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on the future prospects for the Welsh rural economy? Yes, we're committed to delivering jobs and growth across Wales, and we recognise the importance of the uh, rural economy. And we provide support for businesses to start, grow and prosper through Business Wales and Farming Connect. Thank the First Minister very much for that response. At a uh, recent meeting of local farmers in Mid Wales, significant concerns were expressed regarding the current lack of grid capacity in the area to connect renewable energy projects. First Minister, what assessment have you made of how many businesses have been dissuaded from inward investment uh, and expansion, particularly in the uh, Newtown Welshpool area, from this current problem? And what engagement do you plan with the newly appointed uh, Minister for Energy and Climate Change, Amber Rudd, in this regard? Well, the Mid Wales grid, grid is fragile. We know that. It doesn't have a lot of capacity. And we do know that it is a potential break on growth in the area. Of course, that does mean in order to expand or to improve rather grid capacity and indeed resilience, there need to be bigger pylons. And we know where that takes us in terms of the discussions there have been uh, in uh, previous uh, months and years within this assembly. But the reality is uh, the grid is fragile. If the grid is to be expanded in the future and made more resilient and then made stronger, it's inevitable that there will be a need to examine once again what the, the cabling looks like. These are matters for the UK government, of course. These are not matters that are, that are devolved, uh, and it's for the public to assess how that balance is actually created between, on the one hand, the need to ensure resilience and, and uh, greater capacity, and on the other hand, the, the visual impact uh, of what that uh, capacity would mean. Russell George. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, you have referred, First Minister, to the grid being uh, fragile and this being a barrier to businesses that need an increased uh, supply. Uh, but it's my understanding that the proposed project proposed by National Grid is there to only take power out and not to bring power in. But can I just confirm, do you have a different understanding to me? No, the, as far as the national grid is concerned, uh, the, the, the grid changes that they propose, and it's for the Conservative government to examine, uh, involve primarily uh, the, the power being taken out of the uh, areas where there are proposed wind farms. Nevertheless, the fragility of the grid in terms of it being able to service uh, businesses is, is clear. As I say, it's now a matter for him and his party to decide what the grid network will look like in his constituency. David Ellis Thomas. Uh, Thank you, Dame Presiding Officer. May I expand the question to the issue of the Rural Development Programme more generally and ask the First Minister whether he can give rural communities an assurance that the funding saved by the Welsh Government and the previous Minister to be redistributed through developments within the RDP that that will be invested significantly in initiatives that will add value to agricultural produce such as the ex excellent development in the dairy industry which is now starting to be built in Tree de Gwistil near Chwilog in my constituency. Well, of course, I would expect that to happen and also to assist businesses who aren't part of the agricultural sector in order to secure more jobs in rural Wales. And so we would expect that to happen anyway. One of the things which, of course, will be of great help is super fast Cymru and the fa fact that 96 per cent of buildings in Wales will have access to super fast Cymru by September of next year. 
and we're on target to reach the remaining 4% too, but that will be a significant investment as regards the broadband network in rural Wales. What action is the Welsh Government taking to support the independent retail sector? We've taken action to support businesses in Wales across all sectors, including retail. For example, last month we launched the Wales Retail Relief Scheme, which will provide up to £1,500 of business rates relief to qualifying retail food and drinks premises. Thank you, First Minister. In Ponta Dawe, in my own constituency, we have seen a swift increase in the number of independent retailers, Fresh To Go, Decorum and Blissful Bakes, and I can particularly recommend their Bonoffi Cakes. All of these have established over the past year and all are doing very well. As we know, Variety on the high street is a great attraction for tourists and in small towns such as Ponta Dawe that has a population of 5,000, this is particularly important. The Welsh Government has done excellent work in supporting business improvement districts in many larger towns. Do you believe, First Minister, that it would be of great value to promote applications from smaller towns also or even to create a new scheme to target smaller towns with high tourist potential well I mean, really wait with good. well it's true to say of course that the bids themselves there are 10 of them some of them in quite rural towns and others in larger towns um, this is a scheme which will benefit those areas but of course in future, ultimately, we will have to continue to consider how that scheme or a new scheme might assist towns such as Ponta Dawe and towns of the same size in order to ensure that they can grow in a sustainable way in future. Jim Graham. Thank you, Thank you. Officer. The First Minister will know that the retail industry is the second largest private employer in Wales, employing over 130,000 people. And for many companies, corporation tax is less of a worry now than business rates. Isn't it now time to extend your scheme, particularly for small businesses? Yeah, we will not put our small businesses in a, in a more difficult position than exists elsewhere in the UK. However, uh, if it is a proposal from the Welsh Conservatives that they wish to extend any scheme, they will have to explain where the money comes from to do that. That, I think, is the responsible thing to do. Roger Thomas. First Minister, as we all know, there is a challenge facing us in terms of growing the economy and creating a viable economy outside the M4 and A55 corridors. Do you see retailing as a means not only of creating a viable economy in our smaller towns, particularly our market towns in rural Wales, but also a means of boosting other businesses in those areas? Well, it depends how the bids work Aberystwyth is one um, Abergavenny Colwyn Bay Bangor we're talking about towns that aren't large but they are significant in their areas and extremely important as centres within the regions and so we understand that we must secure sustainability in Welsh towns and the only way of doing that is to use the business improvement uh, districts, the bids, and also we're uh, going to work through the vibrant places scheme. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, the um, Chamber of Trading Portal would estimate that the impact on local businesses, and particularly independent uh, retailers, uh, of the closure of Junction 41 has been a, roughly a 20% drop in footfall. Can you give us an indication of when the uncertainty about the future of, of Port Talbot will come to a close, and you'll be able to announce a decision on whether Junction 41 will close permanently or not? Yes, there will be an announcement later this month. Now to question seven, Gwyn Price. Thank you, Claire. Will the first minister make a statement on the maximum benefits of the 2015 Rugby World Cup matches that will be played in Cardiff? Well, yes, we have been working collaboratively with England 2015 to ensure that the eight Wales fixtures secure maximum benefit for Wales, including, of course, leveraging once again uh, the increase in Wales' international profile that will arise as a result of the event. Thank you for that answer. First Minister, the Rugby World Cup will be a fantastic opportunity to showcase the very best of what Wales has to offer on an international audience. 
What action is the Welsh Government taking to encourage fans to visit tourist attractions in Wales? We are working with Visit Britain to encourage official tour operators to include Wales uh, in their fan itineraries. We have taken advertising space uh, in the relevant official travel uh, guides with which uh, visiting fans will plan their trip around, uh, around the UK. We are also undertaking marketing activities with selected overseas fans who are travelling to Wales to see their home team play. Mohammed Ashkar. Further to my friend's question, it is the Rugby World Cup promotes a great opportunity to promote Wales abroad. The fact is the only 3%, only 3% overseas visitors to the United Kingdom spent a night in Wales. This demonstrates that Wales, the Welsh Government has failed to successfully promote Wales as a tourist destination. What action will the First Minister take to ensure we maximise the full potential presented by the Welsh Rugby Cup promotion in Wales to, uh, to foreign visitors? Well, we've just had some of the best tourism figures in terms of visitors to Wales we've ever, ha we've ever had. Uh, so it shows the work that we are doing is uh, working. And you know, bear in mind that when his party was in government in the 70s, 80s, in the late 70s, early 90s, the Wales Tourist Board was banned from marketing Wales abroad. Uh, so we're not going to take any lessons from, uh, from people who actually prevented Wales from being marketed abroad, especially as we celebrate the best tourism sort of figures question. that we've had for many, many years. Bethan Jenkins. Just in the limb line of question. Just following on from the previous question with eight nations who are going to be playing those games here, Uruguay, Fiji, Ireland, Canada and so on. What work have you been doing in those specific nations in order to encourage them to stay in Wales when they are visiting? Because if the games are in the Millennium Stadium, it makes more sense for them to spend their money and to spend their time here in Wales rather than to spend that time in England. Well, to return to what I was saying previously, we've been working with the companies that will be running the tours for people coming into the World Cup in order to ensure that the tours themselves include Wales. And also we've been working with Visit Britain to target people who will be coming in indivi as individuals in order to ensure that they stay in Wales itself. Very many people will be watching the matches, staying overnight and then moving on. Others will wish to stay for longer and we're trying to collaborate in the way I've already mentioned. We're confident that more people will stay in Wales. Ellen Parrott. Uh, Josh Lowy, the First Minister, according to your statement on the NATO summit on the 16th of December, you said that the Welsh Government has spent a million pounds promoting Wales on a world stage using that major event. Can you tell us um, what analysis you have done of um, which kinds of activities were most effective in reaching um, a world audience and how much you anticipate investing in promoting us through the Rugby World Cup as well? Well, in terms of, the, uh, of the, the NATO summit, it was hugely important in terms of showcasing Wales. It was NATO Wales. Uh, it worked very well in terms of the fact that many people came to Wales who would probably would not have come into Wales or were coming to Wales for the first time. Uh, and it was important to ensure that it was understood that we had in Wales a facility that could host an event of that size, uh, as it did with the Ryder Cup in, uh, in 2010. Uh, in terms of promoting Wales for those coming in for the Rugby World Cup, as I say, we're working with um, organisations such as Visit Britain to make sure that when people come to the World Cup, they come to Wales and stay in Wales as well. Question 8, Sandy Mewes. Uh, thank you. Uh, First Minister, will you provide an update on the Welsh Government's eye health care delivery plan? Well, we remain the only government in the world with an eye health care delivery plan. There's been significant progress over the last 12 months. And it's a tribute to all those involved, including NHS staff and the third sector. Uh, thank you for that. This lunchtime, I was delighted to sponsor the annual Wales Vision Strategy event here in the Senate, where uh, uh, the Deputy Minister there gave uh, uh, a speech outlining the work of the Welsh Government, which was widely welcomed. Many of the people present have been central in the drive to improve eye care services in Wales, and I know that you recognise their dedication and hard work. But over the next 25 years, the number of people with sight loss is expected to double. So. Minister, can you First Minister, can you provide an update on the work that's going on to ensure health statistics and demographics are being routinely included in NHS needs assessments? Yes. Well, the integrated medium-term plans of health boards uh, and indeed our trusts are underpinned by comprehensive needs assessments. They cover both the physical and mental health and well-being of the resident 
population. Those plans are scrutinised by the health boards and the trusts and ourselves as Welsh Government to ensure that health statistics and demographics are routinely included in order, of course, to make sure that the plan continues to be effective. Jonathan Saunders. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Minister, the delivery plan acknowledges the need to work on the delays, and that was raised a lot in the plan uh, on patients being seen for follow-up treatment. Will the Minister provide an update on the action taken by your government to work with NHS Wales Informatics Service to develop electronic referrals and electronic patient records for eye care in order to deal with this problem? Yes, we work very closely with them. It's important that the patients uh, involved uh, do not experience any uh, delays, uh, and uh, we have invested £34 million in extra uh, eye care and in terms of primary and secondary care over the past three years. And they provided new treatment. It was only in 2007 that there was no treatment available for wet, uh, age-related macular de degeneration. Uh, now, of course, uh, 16,000 courses of treatment are being provided in Wales, and that helped, of course, to prevent sight loss that was caused by wet AMD, a treatment that wasn't available, of course, before 2007. Anna Roberts. With, uh, proven need of Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I accept that demand is increasing, but according to the action plan, there are over 7,800 people in North Wales currently awaiting eye treatment including 568 who have waited over 36 weeks. So if you are carrying out all of this monitoring work, how can you give assurances to people in North Wales that the situation will improve, given that at present the main response of the health board clearly is to buy in services from England? Well, what's important is that people should receive the service, in my view, once it comes from England or Wales. Because okay, we use uh, we've been used to receiving services from England, and of course, the numbers are waiting less than twenty six weeks. Well, that is being reduced, and there are some that are waiting for less than eleven weeks. And we hope that these figures will improve again. Two, which is the business statement, and I call on.